I want to thank Mr. Kenneth Jensen and his wife Mary Lou for, for being here. Um, so it's about Veterans Day, and so it, when I say Veterans Day, it brings to mind uh, probably a different story in all of you, but it, it's a holiday where we get to celebrate those who have served, and everybody has a, a, a unique story. This story in particular is uh, tremendous. When I read the article last year, um, uh, it gave me two emotions. One, I was tickled because I love hearing, seeing articles uh, trying as they are about people that serve. It's very dear to me. It's what I do. Uh, and I love to see other people that, that have gone through it. But also, it was very moving and hard to read uh, because it was it's a struggle. And so I, I'm, I can't wait to hear it. And I won't, don't want to take any more time. And so, Mr. Jensen, the floor is yours. And I welcome you. Thank you. I, I want to thank Admiral Williamson for that <laughs> modest <laughs> I'm so glad to be here, and I want to thank all of you for keeping the whole world safer just by doing your job every day. And I really do appreciate that. I like that song called, My Country Tis of Thee, Sweet Land of Liberty, and that's what keeps us free and the whole world, and I want to give you a hand on that. Thanks. And I'd like, uh, like to uh, tell you something about my wife. If I have that much PTSD, she has that much. <laughs> and I'm beginning to recognize that and the source of it. <laughs> okay. okay, I'd like to tell you a little bit, a little bit about World War II. We had terms for, for peace, and that was unconditional surrender. Germany did not want to surrender, nor neither did the Japanese, because they were working on the atomic bomb. They had a rocket that would reach as far as New York City. We learned rocketry from the Germans after the war and they already had the jet plane in operation. But they didn't have very many six by sixes. We had thousands of them. They didn't have very many C-47s. And, and we had thousands of them. We overwhelmed them. I've been on a, on a bombing mission to Berlin, February the 3rd, 1945. And there were 1,000 B-17s in that. 750 P-51s were with us. And before we, we got, before our group got to the target, because when the first, when the first planes were over the target, those behind, the last ones, were still coming over the coast. Unbelievable. We overwhelmed them. And there was a, Magnificent response to that. When, before we got to the target, the sky was black with anti-aircraft fire. And when we went over the target, that dropped down, and there wasn't a shot fired from the ground that I could tell. And I said to myself, they must have run out of ammunition, because you can't keep firing that much without, without running down or, or losing some of your ammunition. Now, I grew up a coal digger. My dad owned and operated a small coal mine up in the hills in northeastern Utah. And when I was 14 years old, I'd been trained from the time I was six years old to, to operate a 200-horsepower steam boiler. It had a, the boiler tube boiler was six feet in diameter and 20 feet long, and it was all brick and stoned in. And when I was 14 years old, I had been taught to operate that steam boiler, and I would operate a big steam hoist. You had two pistons, one big one here, one over here. And you'd, here was a throttle, and when you'd pull that throttle back, it'd go choo, choo, choo. Then it, it, that, that was a crawl. And so that, that's the way we grew up on those days. Nowadays, uh, if, if my dad had, if 
It said then and today that they put my dad in jail for letting me, <laughs> let me work with machinery. <laughs> well, and so that's what the whole world was, a, was up against, was a, a soldiers and sailors and airmen who had been brought up that way. That's why we won the war. That's why, why we stuck to it. There were, there were over, over 47,000 Iron Men were killed in the air over Germany. Now my older brother Claire, well, he was a crew chief on the ground. And when I got there, it was a couple of years later, but he, he wasn't so afraid of me being shot down as he was me coming back dead in an airplane. And, and <clears throat> And so that was a price that we paid over, I, I want to say it again, 47,000 airmen killed in the air over Germany. And there were 21,000 who had been shot down, bailed out, survived, and uh, were, were POWs, and I was one of those. And I'm so glad that it was only from February the 16th, 1945, until, until the end of the war, about three months, and that's one uh, I'm glad I had the experience, you know, because I, I, I came, the Germans were under fire where we, when we landed on the ground, and uh, we landed right in their lines, and if I'd gone maybe a quarter of a mile further, I'd have been in the British lines with uh, General Montgomery and his British, or British Army. Well, th th this is an exciting story, and, and, and I'm, I'm so glad that I was there. And I, I didn't didn't ask for it. I didn't know what I was getting into, and because I, I was I was the most surprised person in the world when we when we had to bail out. And I said to myself as I stepped out of that out of that hatch, I said, "Oh, oh, there won't be any warm bunk tonight." <laughs> <laughs> and the first night I I spent in Germany, I was in a barn, right at the side of the ground, or just right beside the road. And there was loose hay about that high, and uh, and so and I had all my flight gear still on, so I just jumped up on top of that hay and went to sleep. And when while I was asleep, I was dreaming. I was back in the hills in Utah, and there was a thunderstorm going on. Well, when I woke up, I I I had never heard it before, but I knew that it was British artillery fire. And so uh, it, it was so exciting to be. Uh, first, you're in the air and you get shot down, and then you land right in the middle of the battlefield. They, they put us in a jeep. The, the, the German soldier that picked, just picked me up, uh, first thing he said to me was, Englander? I said proudly, American, you know? Uh, or I, I don't know whether my voice quivered or not, but uh, he, was in, he was in charge. Because then he said, pistol, you know, one know if I had a gun, and uh, no, no guns. And, and then uh, I, had, I did have a, a knife, because I figured if I ever landed in the water, I'd be able to cut the, cut the shrouds. And so uh, he, we were going back over this uh, uh, area. And while, while we was right in the middle of this here big clearing, I heard a noise which I thought was a stick of bombs landing. Went broom, just like that. And, uh, and, and I dove onto the ground. And as soon as I was, I was in the air, I realized it was an anti-aircraft fire. They had, they had about 10 or 15 of them in a circle, 200 feet big, and they would fire them simultaneously. And, uh, and I looked back to see what my guard was doing, and he was on the ground too. <laughs> and, and then and I had picked up, I got a piece of flak that came through the side of the turret, and it went through my lip and it sheared off my three front teeth. They stayed that way for, for three months. I had to keep my lip buttoned down over the top and I'd hold my tongue underneath it to keep the cold air from getting to it. Uh, but uh, we, we got back out of, out of that clearing and they were dressing my wound. And our navigator, Menace, he had to be within 100 yards of where I was and they bailed out before we did. After they dressed my wound, they put me in a, in a, in a jeep, German Volkswagen, and we went down through a forest road. 
and uh, in this forest road, uh, one of our fighter planes comes down shooting. And he just pulled over the side like that, and in a matter of seconds, that plane's gone by. On, on one side of the road, there was a long line of German soldiers. They were marching away from the front. On the other side, they were coming up to the front. So we, it, it, was a, it was a real World War II battlefield. And, uh, and so, the, so we, we spent the, night, the rest of the night in that barn. The next day, we, we continued down the way. And I'll tell you about one thing that happened. We, we were out in the country. There was a menace, a navigator, and myself, and, and two German guards. And they picked up a couple of uh, uh, parts of, the, of the, their army. It was two girls, and each had a, they had a trunk that weighed about 10 or 15 pounds apiece. When, and I w was selected to carry them. Well, one time we took a break, and I guess I waited too long to go pick up the, the suitcases, and one of the German soldiers cocked his rifle. And, and I said to myself as I walked over there, he's not going to shoot me, because if they do, they, they can't make Minnis, the navigator, carry the suitcases because he's, a, an, an, he's a, an officer. And, uh, and they're not going to carry themselves, so I figured I was all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so there were, there were things like that went on. And, uh, and I, I crossed over the... Frankfurt on the, on the Rhine, the Rhine River. Now the Rhine River uh, is up and the, the, one of the nearest big cities was a place called Krefeld, for you people who have been in Germany. I've, I've been over Berlin and I've been over a place called uh, uh, Dresden. That, that's controversial today because Roosevelt, Stalin, and Churchill got together and and uh, Stalin insisted that, that we bomb uh, Dresden. Uh, uh, but it did have, that they, they did have some huge uh, railway stations there. And they had other th things which were worthy of uh, at least one bombing mission. But, okay, to, to keep this, uh, Keep this uh, going out. There, there was a place in Germany where they they interrogated all the all the pilots and all the bomber crews. A place called Oberrussel. I recently read a book about how they how much they knew. For example, when I was at Oberrussel, they uh, put me in solitary confinement for about three or four days, and then after that they would take you out. and And he told me the names of all my crew members. Well, I figured out lately they, they didn't get it from my, from my fellow crew members. They already knew it. Well, when they found out the name of our pilot, they knew who all the rest of the crew were. Their, their intelligence was that good. And, and uh, to, to me, that was fascinating, fascinating because there, there's things even today that uh, that I figure out what happened. For example, I, why, why my, my navigator would, and I would be with, within 100 yards of each other. You couldn't, you couldn't do that if you planned it. It'd be impossible. But that, that's the way it worked out. And now, I, I want to tell you about the, the thing, the most, most helpless feeling I ever had in my life. We were, uh, they, they, we had gone through their interrogation, we were outfitted with a clean clothes and new clothes at a place called Wetzler. And then we were put in boxcars behind the passenger, behind the passenger trains. And, uh, and we were out in the country, traveling south from, uh, from uh, northern Germany to uh, we were headed for Nuremberg, which is in southern Germany. And on that, uh, we were out in the country, and somebody said, here they come. And it was our own fighter planes, P-51s. And they, and they with one burst, they, they, they disabled the, the locomotive, and then they went over the passenger trains, and they shot up these three boxcars we were in. Now, that's the most helpless feeling I ever heard. 
that I've ever had in my life. Uh, and uh, because if you hit the ground, hit the deck, you just become a bigger target. And then uh, the 51s, they had three 50 caliber machine guns in each wing. And terrible firepower when they're concentrated. And I, I heard somebody holler, ow, my leg. And the next time they made it pass, uh, they had finally all gone. Because they, they saw, instead of those boxcars blowing up, because they, they would carry ammunition in them, there was a, so they, 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 they continued on. And in fact, uh, I was back at Savannah, Georgia one time, and, uh, and I met a man by the name of Kenneth Scott and got to talking to him, and he was a P-51 pilot, and he said, he said, you may not like me, but he said, I think that was my outfit that, that hit that particular, particular train. And, and by the name, his, his name was, was Kenneth Scott, I think I said that. Now, now we, we were at, at Nürn, Nuremberg, for after, and, and that's where there, there's a big stadium there where Hitler gave a lot of his uh, his great his great talks, uh, and uh, and so after a while, I, the, the Allies were getting closer, and they decided to move us, and I was uh, we got out of the we was right close to the railway station. And, and so the first night I, we spent in the sleeping just out in the open on, in, a, in a churchyard. And I can remember thinking to myself, I wonder if mom knows I'm all right. <laughs> and that's the, and I had, anyhow, just, just thoughts that passed over your mind. And I can remember talking to myself at different times about things that were going on. Well, now, and then, when we moved out of out of uh, Moosburg, not not Moosburg, but Nuremberg, there was a. We were out about six miles out of, out of town, and we're looking back at the city, and then I witnessed what I call a, at least a 500 plane, if not a thousand plane, raid on on Nuremberg, and for, with the sound of the airplane engines and with the sound of the bombs exploding and the anti-aircraft fire, there was something you could see in the air. There was nothing there, but you could see streaks in the, in the air. Now, maybe some of you engineers can tell me what was happening, because I haven't seen anything like it before or since. Something to do with compression and release. Uh, if anybody has any, any theories about that, let me know, because I wonder about it all the time. Now, and so, so, and then we were going to move from Nuremberg, we were going cross country over Bavaria to a place called Moosburg. Now that's about 120 miles and, and I got that one pinpointed on the calendar because while we were on that trek, President Roosevelt died. That's around the 12th of April, something like that. Anybody know for sure? Okay, well, that's how. But that, 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 that's the way it was. But uh, I use that to pinpoint that, that time frame down. Now, one time in doing this trek, I learned how to uh, explain why our traffic gets slowed down, you know. This here, all bunched up, then it, then it decompresses, then it compresses again. You do the same thing if you're marching, because I was with 12,000 Air Force prisoners that were in, in Nuremberg. 12,000 Air Force men. It tells you a little bit about some of the situation going on. Well, as, as, as we were in this trek, I call it, and, uh, and I was taking a break, and there was a guy, a guy coming with a group, of pen, a group of people coming up to us, and he said, Kay Jensen, what are you doing here? And it was uh, Tommy Freestone from Vernal, Utah. 
had to go all that way to, to meet each other again. And, and he was a first cousin to a good friend of mine. But, but that, that, that was a, and, and I thought to myself several times while we were on that trek out in the country across in Bavaria, I said to myself, I would even pay them to, to take this trek. <laughs> And so, so even war has its, uh, its moments, good or bad. And, and so, so we ended up at a place called Moosburg, it's down on Austrian border. I don't know if he, he shows some pictures there. Uh, it was at Nuremberg where I first realized that, that, uh, that this could be, a, could be a long break without any breaks. And because uh, food was in short supply, in fact, one time they, if we if we existed on the food that the, they would give us, we would be dead in six months. It was designed to do that. But the thing that saved our lives was uh, the Red Cross American Red Cross food parcels. If any of you have ever worked in Red Cross, uh, why give them a thanks from me. Anybody ever know anybody that worked with Red Cross? Well, thank you. They, 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 I'll tell you what was in them. They, they, had a, they had a can of Klim powdered milk. They had a, a can of, a, of a sardines and a can of a beef and a can of a, a graham crackers. Uh, it, it, was, it was what I would call nutri good nutrition. And it's, and I think it saved my life because the, the Germans, they were starving to death themselves. And the reason they kept on going because they, they, they were, like I say, they were working on the atomic bomb. They had a jet plane in the operation. And they had a rocket that reached as far as New York City. That was a lot going for, for them. Well, we, we arrived at, at Mooseburg and uh, General Patton. It was sometime in towards the last of uh, April of 19, 1945. And uh, General Patton her, had heard, he was headed for Berlin. He had, had, had heard that uh, Germ Hitler was going to kill all the POWs. Well, you know, Patton, he was a rough talker, and I think he had probably got more done if he hadn't have been so, if he'd cleaned up your language a little bit. Because. Uh, <laughs> One time they asked him what he would do if he was here in the middle and there was Russians on one side and there was uh, the Germans on the other side. What would he do? He said, I'd attack both sides at the same time. <laughs> You've probably heard that. Okay. Uh, and we, we were just, just south from uh, Moosburg there were some huge meadows, and they, it was, I still remember the name, they called Landshut, and they, they brought in hundreds of C-47s and landed them on those wide, big, big meadows. And so they, they took us out of there, and uh, they just line up and fill up one plane, and it would take off, and the next the rest, until they, they would fill up another plane. And so that's how I got out of, got out, got out of Germany went in on an airplane and came back on an airplane. They, they, they flew us, some, some of them went to Paris, and, but they took us to a place in France called uh, Camp, Camp Lucky Strike, in La Havre, La Havre, France. And from there we went on a, on a Liberty ship and, uh, and sailed home. Now, uh, I, uh, I, I'm going to give you a privilege to, if you have any, is it anybody have any questions about anything I haven't talked about? What was your position on the plane? Oh, I, I was a ball turret gunner. It's just after the, yeah, yeah, the, the, some people call, call it the belly gunner. Yeah, right, right here's a picture of it. And uh, it's four feet in diameter and you can go straight, you can look straight down, or you can go to the horizontal, and you do 360 degrees around this way. But we were, when we were flying, we were assigned, when we were in the formation, to whatever section of the air that, 
that you would uh, guard against with, uh, from any enemy planes. It was no protection against anti-aircraft fire. And uh, uh, in, in all the times that we were there, 23 missions, uh, I've seen airplanes go by, but the Germans did not, did not have enough planes or enough living pilots to to uh, be any threat to most bomber crews. However, before we got to our to our uh, uh, group in England, we flew out of a place in England called Molesworth. It's north of London, out in the country. The 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 place where we flew out of was uh, an old Royal Air Force fighter plane base. Now that, that fighter plane base, the runways were too short for the B-17s, but we still flew. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I, I remember we had landed, we were okay. Our, our pilot, his name was Robert Wirtz, and the co-pilot was Calvin Durst. And uh, that, that Pilot, he was so good, I could never tell, being a passenger in the plane, when we were on the ground or when we would take off. The same way coming in, he, 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 I could never tell the transition. But when the, when, the, when Durst flew, landed, we just go bouncing down the field. <laughs> <laughs> but but Durst in flying formation, he, he was immaculate. And we'd sometimes we'd fly almost wingtip to wingtip, and if that plane would move that way, he'd move that way and back and forth. So, so they they were they made a great team. Now our navigator, like you say, his name was Minnis. And one time we came back from a mission, we were flying under the clouds over England, and we were lost. And so the radio man he did some triangulation. Now you engineers know how to do that. Uh, and, and so we found out where we were, and so that we could get, so we could get back to our base, because we had to fly under those clouds. And uh, one time uh, we were going this way, and there's another plane, the V-17, coming right, just like that. And uh, I don't know who decided what, but one up, one up, one up, the other went down. <laughs> it was, uh, it was more dangerous than flying over Germany. <laughs> Now, I want to tell you a little bit about the airplane. When we got hit, when we got hit with those anti-aircraft fire, we just dropped the bombs. And the blue number one engine must have been a direct hit because it blew it clear off its mountings. And I tore this one off just so you could get the picture. And it, because it was in that position. And, and it went going through the air, propeller still spinning, Come over here and made a slash right down through the through the side of the plane just after the ball the lower ball turret. Now we didn't know what caused that at the time because we didn't see it. But we talked to another crew that had been shot down previously, and that day they were watching us when that happened. And so that, that solved a mystery <laughs> to us. Now. And the number, number two engine, the controls were knocked out. And number three engine, the controls were knocked out. And we would have gone into a spin, and no one would have been able to, to have escaped from the plane. But the Durst, our co-pilot, the, the pilot was knocked unconscious by the concussion from this uh, explosion out here off the wing. And so the, the co-pilot, Got the plane back in control. He had to feather the props on number number two and three, and he, so he had still one engine going. And so our plane was probably flying sideways like that, but we were still flying. And it's a it's a good thing that we that we that they did that the pilot had ordered everybody to bail out, but we didn't we didn't hear the the, the command because uh, our the, the intercom system was knocked out and not functioning, and so we didn't hear it. And, uh, and so I, I, I didn't know how big the, 
the hole was in my in my oxygen mask because at 32,000 feet you'll be unconscious in in two minutes without without oxygen. And so I come out of my turret and put on another oxygen mask, and uh, wow. Well, uh, <coughs> <laughs> and so then uh, the radio man and the waste gunner, Walt Campbell, they went up to front to see what to do. And they come back and they said, get out of here, there's nobody up there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that didn't leave too much choice, but the, but the, the plane was still flying. Uh, and it was probably with that engine pulling us up here, and we'd probably go in almost sideways. But we were still in the air, and uh, and and so when I, I think I told you already about when I looked down there. Uh, well, I tell you how, how you bail out of a plane like that is, you you, you get a hold of a, a strap like that, and you pull on it, and and, and that pulls the, the the pins out of the hinges. And then, then they kick the, kick the hatch out, and so that leaves you nothing to keep banging around after you, after you get in position. And so, uh, and, and so, uh, the, the, way, the, the tail gunner, I, I didn't ever see him, but he, he was right behind us. And, uh, and I was the last one to leave before he did. But he never got out of the plane. He he he, he must have been either terribly wounded or he uh, freaked out. I don't, I don't know what people do, but uh, we had practiced bailing out, you might say, because every time we we go in a fight, the first thing we we would put on after our, our clothes would be our uh, our parachute harness, and then uh, we get in the waist of the plane, and we would. Uh, Go over and pick up a, a, a you know, chest pack parachute, and then we go over and step out on as if we were bailing out. So we had practiced that that maneuver many a time, and and so, but uh, we, we've talked about that Gearing and I uh, about what we should have done with it with Bennett, because Bennett was a tail gunner and he was in the plane. The, the, nav the bombardier had been killed instantly, and, uh, and the other body in the plane was a, was a tail gunner. And we, we have said that we should have just threw him out, let him, let him uh, pull a ripcord or, or head for the ground. And this is so, uh, I, I want to take then. And so the, this, this engine here, it was, uh, he had to feather the prop. That means you put it right so that it doesn't do any drag. <laughs> Same one here, so we had this one engine still going here. So we, we were flying uh, almost, I would guess almost sideways. We couldn't have gone very far. It would have been suicide because uh, after we were on the ground, I, I seen another B-17 go by and it was bracketed by anti-aircraft fire at low altitude. <coughs> Uh, it, it was not a friendly place to be, but that, that's the way it was, and that, that's a, you had to have somebody that had to have some problems to even fly. <laughs> but that's, you know, they, they would sing the song, off we go into the wild blue yonder, give her the gun. <laughs> uh, uh, just singing that song, you wonder what kind of people they were, they, they, they got in those places. <laughs> But that, that, that's what it took. And uh, yeah, I think I mentioned over 47,000 were killed in the air and the 21,000 were, were POWs. And that, that, that's a lot. That, that's, that's a lot of uh, price to pay. And uh, I want to tell you something about what happened. We were in our basic training. We were over at Buckley Field, Colorado, and when when we were out on bivouac, why one of the one of the one of the recruits lost his rifle, 
and the, and the supply sergeant that will cost you $150. He said, well, he said, what would happen if I, if I lost a tyke? He looked up on the chart, 300,000. <laughs> he said, well, now I know why the captain always goes down with the ship. <laughs> Oh, so that, that, that uh, you know, if you can't laugh at it, you, you, you won't survive. So every, every situation I had that was a traumatic, I've, I've looked back at it and tried to make it, you know, if you revisit a, a situation in your mind, you find out a way to laugh about it. And it, it's, it's a, not only a lifesaver, but it's, it's good for the soul. And so, I'd like to thank you for your for coming down and listening to this to this kook of fun in World War II. <laughs>